The story of the SS Stephen Hopkins is a much heralded and well-known tale of courage under fire. It bears repeating. Captain Paul Buck knew immediately his ship was in trouble when he looked through the binoculars on the morning of September 27, 1942. Sailing alone in the South Atlantic, en route from Cape Town to Dutch Guiana, the Liberty ship had stumbled on two German surface raiders during a period of reduced visibility. At this point, Captain Buck had three choices. Run, which was hopeless against the faster ships. Surrender or fight. He immediately rang general quarters and sent his gun crew fore and aft. Both of the German ships were much more heavily armed than the Hopkins. The smaller Stia and the much larger Tenenfels fired the first salvos. Buck turned the Hopkins, which was sailing in ballast, riding high in the water and making a good target to keep his stern to the German ships. This presented the enemies with a smaller target and brought the Liberty's largest gun, a four-incher mounted aft, to bear. As he ran to the gun, Ensign Kenneth Willett, commander of the armed guard, took a load of shrapnel to the stomach. The blow staggered the young officer, but he continued on, took command of the gun, and scored the Hopkins' first hits against the Stia. The ships pounded each other as the distance closed to under 1,000 yards. At this point, a shell from one of the raiders destroyed the American Liberty's engine, leaving her dead in the water and unable to maneuver. On the foredeck, second mate Joseph Lehman directed fire from the twin 37mm guns, scoring hit after hit against the two enemy ships. As the vessels closed, both Americans and Germans turned to their machine guns, sweeping each other's decks and killing gun crews and seamen alike. With his companions lying dead on the deck, 19-year-old engine cadet Edwin O'Hara single-handedly manned one of the big guns, and with only five rounds left, muscled the 50-pound shells into the breach and hit the enemy ships. He was killed after firing the Hopkins' last round when the ammunition magazine below exploded. The entire battle took only 20 minutes, when it was over, both German ships were on fire and the Stia was rapidly sinking, her crew frantically trying to abandon ship. But the Hopkins had paid dearly for her heroics. Now a twisted hulk of burning steel and full of holes, she was going down fast. What remained of her crew abandoned ship. She had started the day with a complement of 56, including one passenger. Only 19 survivors remained, four of whom would die before the lifeboat reached the coast of Brazil one month later. The SS Stephen Hopkins was granted the Gallant Ship Award by the United States Maritime Commission. She has the distinction of being the very first American ship of any type to sink an enemy vessel during World War II. Six of the Hopkins crew, more than any other single vessel, received the Merchant Marine Distinguished Service Medal. Four of these awards for valor were given posthumously. When the commander of the German raider Tenenfels filed his report, he incorrectly stated that the Hopkins had been equipped with at least seven large guns because the fire from the American Liberty had been so intense and unrelenting. In 1955, a German newspaper reported that the Tenenfels had dropped her flag to half-mast and made one complete circle around the spot where the Hopkins sank to honor the ship and her crew that had fought so bravely against such overwhelming odds.
Captain William Clint Daniel was barely conscious and bleeding to death in the wheelhouse of his ship. During rescue operations to save the crew of a sinking British freighter, Clint Daniel's ship, the SS Del Isle, hit a mine and the blast catapulted the main mast through the bridge, pinning the master's leg to the deck and covering him with debris. In the dark of night, the crew abandoned ship, unable to find their captain before launching the lifeboats. They were about 12 miles off the coast of Newfoundland, and although it was October 19, 1943, and cold, the seas were fairly calm. The small freighter was listing and sinking slowly, and the men in the lifeboats decided to go back and gather more supplies. The men also knew that at least one crew member was unaccounted for. A stray, mongrel dog picked up on some dock somewhere, taken aboard a ship's mascot, named Blackout due to the dog's all-black color, and treated like the Queen of Sheba by officers and crew alike. The men may have chosen the name Blackout to remind them to keep the ship completely dark at night because even the glow of a cigarette could be spotted by a submarine more than a mile away. Captain Clint Daniel thought he was hallucinating when he heard his men calling out for the dog. Then he realized they had returned to rescue the mutt and he screamed for help, feeling great relief at hearing the footfalls of his rescuers coming up the inside ladder. When the crew cleared the wood and canvas that covered their captain, they soon realized he was hopelessly pinned down by tons of steel. But as luck would have it, the captain's leg that was held to the deck was an artificial limb from an accident at sea many years before. They detached the leg, carried their captain to the boat deck, and gently lowered him into the lifeboat. Although there were numerous injuries among them, every man survived the sinking. The crew never did find the dog, and when the ship finally slipped beneath the surface, she took Black out and her litter of newborn puppies down with her. Some weeks later, while recuperating in a hospital in St. John's, Newfoundland, Captain Clendaniel received a present wrapped in paper and tied in ribbon. He opened it to see his artificial leg that had somehow floated free from the wreckage and was found on a Canadian beach by a young boy. Great acts of courage have nothing to do with guns and bullets. Sometimes it's just a matter of saying no to death and making sure that a young shipmate says no as well. Elviro Santiago had just finished serving the afternoon tea when the first torpedo struck the passenger ship on the port side. The explosion threw him into the air and when he landed his left leg was shattered. Up on the bridge, Captain George T. Sullivan, who would go on to distinguish himself commanding the SS Daniel Morgan during the infamous convoy PQ-17 by repeatedly fighting off German aircraft to protect his and other ships, had a big problem. One of the lifeboats had already been destroyed, and besides his crew of 97, Sullivan had 47 passengers, including women and children, and he had to get them off safely. He turned his ship, the city of New York, into the wind and ordered her abandoned. Back on deck, Santiago, who was suffering a concussion and bleeding from the mouth, nose, and ears, knew his life depended on getting to the boats. He started to hobble to the boat deck when he saw a child screaming in fear and calling for his mother. Without hesitation, Santiago grabbed the youngster somehow secured a life jacket around the boy and dragged him to the lifeboats. They were too late. By the time they reached the boat deck, all of the lifeboats had been launched. The men in the boats yelled at Santiago to jump, but the explosion from the second torpedo made the decision for him by throwing him off the ship and into the water. Still clutching the five-year-old boy, Santiago swam to one of the boats and they were saved. Throughout the entire ordeal, Santiago never let go of the child, and as luck would have it, 
The boy's mother was also safe in the lifeboat. On March 29, 1942, some 40 miles off the coast of North Carolina, the city of New York sank in just 20 minutes. 26 people, including both passengers and crew, lost their lives. After months of recuperation, Santiago did what so many other merchant seamen did during the war. He shipped out again. He was there with the Allies invading Sicily, helped in the liberation of New Guinea, and was offshore during the attack on the beaches of Normandy. The men who crewed the German submarines during World War II came from an old world European tradition of warfare. They knew the importance, from Germany's standpoint, of sinking Allied merchant shipping because in modern warfare it is critical to destroy an enemy's ability to manufacture and deliver the goods of war. They were warriors, to be sure, and they were very good at their job. But once the merchant ship was sinking, the German submariners stopped the attack. There are numerous accounts of sub-commanders offering water, food, blankets, and even positions and directions towards land to the survivors in the lifeboats. Some were even given medical assistance, in a few cases on the submarine itself. There were a few merchant seamen taken as prisoners of war, but relatively few. Submarines simply didn't have the room to house extra people. The German submariners knew the rules of war, and in the vast number of cases, they played by those rules. However, the Japanese, working under the ancient code of Bushido, were a different breed of cat. Bound for home and sailing alone, the Liberty ship Richard Hovey was hit March 29, 1944, by three torpedoes from a Japanese sub that broke the ship in two and guaranteed a sinking. But that wasn't enough. The submarine then surfaced and began shelling the doomed freighter more to kill the crew than to sink the ship. After the ship's personnel had abandoned into life rafts and lifeboats, the attack continued on the unarmed men. The Japanese fired machine guns and rifles and even rammed one of the lifeboats. Then they took the captain and three others as prisoners and disappeared under the sea. Only two of the ship's four lifeboats remained, with a total of 63 survivors between them. The boat separated, and number four lifeboat, with 25 aboard, was picked up only three days later. When the men in number one boat had finished plugging the bullet holes and patching themselves up, they inventoried their supplies and realized that they were again in dire straits. The attack on their boat had ruptured the fresh water tanks and they had only a fraction of water necessary to keep them alive. Alone in the blistering Arabian Sea, just 16 degrees north of the equator, 38 men were facing the very real possibility of an agonizing death by dehydration, which often ends in raving insanity. Which is when junior assistant engineer, Arthur John Dreschler, decided to make fresh drinkable water from seawater. Using spare parts from the lifeboat, he fashioned a simple yet effective desalination device. The survivors described it as looking something like a hillbilly still, but instead of moonshine, it produced an incredible seven ounces of water per day for each man on the boat. The lifeboat drifted for 16 days before being spotted by a British ship and every man on board was saved. With his amazing engineering skills and cool-headed determination to keep himself and his shipmates alive, Dreschler won the Merchant Marine Distinguished Service Medal.